everybody. It is indeed an honor to be in the house of God one more time. Can everybody say amen? amen? On this beautiful Mother's Day, I know the weather is not what we expected outside, but it's still a consuming fire in here. Amen? I want to personally say happy Mother's Day to all the mothers physically, the mothers in Christ, and the mothers who will be aspiring mothers. Happy Mother's Day to all of you. Uh, my mother's in the house. Somebody say amen. Uh, my mother is a very special person because the reason why I say that she's special is because she made me. And there was a path that I was supposed to go on. But you know, there's something about praying mothers. Y'all know what I'm talking about? There's something about praying mothers that keep you from going astray. So at the times where I didn't know she was praying, she was praying. Because I wasn't supposed to be here right now. But her prayers curbed my path and set me on the right way. So thanks a lot, Mom. I'm in the house today with my beautiful wife and my beautiful cousin uh, and my beautiful mother. They came all the way from Brooklyn with me. So in case y'all try to mess with me when the sermon is over, I got my crew here with me. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm not going to be before you too long today because I know the mother's got to eat. So... I'm just going to get right into the word. Can everybody say amen? amen? Shall we pray, Father God, your people are here. And we're longing for a word from you today. Father, we're not here for show. But we really need a blessing from on high today, oh God. Father, remove me. I'm not worthy. Speak through me, O oh God, that when it's all said and done, and when we all say amen, someone in this place may be changed forevermore. Uh, this is our prayer in the precious name of, our, of, of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let everyone say amen and amen. Our sermonic text today will be taken from three different passages in the Bible. Uh, our sermon today is like secret deodorant. It's strong enough for a man, but it's made for a woman. Amen? So we're going to be looking at three different texts real quick. First text is in Luke 8, 46 to 48. That's Luke 8, 46 to 48. If you're on the way, say, preacher, wait for me. If you got it, say, thank you, Jesus. And if you're ready to go, here we go. Uh, the Bible says in Luke 4, uh, 46, it says, but Jesus said, someone touched me. I know that because power has gone out from me. 47 says, then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. 48, then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Then we're going to jump on over to John 8, 17. John 8, 7 to 11. I'm sorry. John 8, 7 to 11. And the Bible says again, when they came on to questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, let any of one of you without sin be the first to throw the stone at her. Again in eight, he says, the Bible says he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. Nine says, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time from the oldest ones to the youngest, until it was just Jesus and the woman left. And then Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, 
Where are those that condemn you? Do you see them? She says, no, sir. Then he said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and leave, leave your life of sin. And finally, in Luke 7, 44 to 50, the Bible says, then he turned towards the woman. And he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. And you did not give me water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered had not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown, but whoever has been forgiven little, little loves little. And then Jesus said her, to her, your sins have been forgiven. And then in 49, the other guests had begun to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you go in peace. I want to talk to you a little bit on the title today, Woman, Thou Art Loose. Woman, Thou Art Loose. Now, in the story of the woman of, with the, uh, the woman that was caught in the act of adultery, I, when I began to study this story, a lot of questions came up and I tried to answer them in my study. But here's the thing that I, I, I want us to realize when we zoom in on the story, family. The woman that was caught in the act of adultery, we did not know her before this time. Meaning that we did not know her struggle. We did not know the things that she had issues with. We did not know her temptations. We just realized that all of a sudden that there was a woman brought before Jesus for questioning. Now... When we recap the story, we have to realize that in my personal opinion, and I say that's my opinion, because it's so uh, impromptu and it's so abrupt, I feel that she was set up. Okay, because how did we know that she was doing what she was doing when they said what she was doing? So in my mind, I believe that she was set up, but now the story begins to unfold as she's brought before Jesus. Now at this time in history, it was the holiday of Sukkot. And at that time in Jerusalem, Jerusalem was very busy. There was a lot going on. It was a festival. And the Bible says that Jesus was teaching in the synagogue. And they brought this woman to, to, to him and they said, they said to him, teacher, we've caught this lady in the act and they were not calling him teacher as if to proclaim him. They were calling him teacher as to mock him. But the way, you see, Jesus is so smooth in the way that he handles his business. You see, instead of answering the, the rhetorical question, he starts to write in the sand. But this is what happens. You see... You have to understand that this woman, if she was caught in the act of adultery, that means she was, she was kind of naked. Uh -huh. She was kind of afraid. She was kind of embarrassed. And when they dragged her body and threw her in front of Jesus, it was a state of transformation. Now follow me. You see, when Jesus started writing in the sand, it, 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 it caused a ripple effect of the accuser. Now, you see, these men were scribes and Pharisees. These men were the ones who were proclaimed to be holy. These men are, are, are walked around like, you know, they had no sin in them. These men walked around like because they were the Sabbath school superintendent and the first elder, like they had no sin in their hearts. The Bible said they appeared to be holy because of their outward appearance, meaning their clothes was holy. Uh -huh, they had the three-piece suit. 
Uh huh. They had the nice shoes to go along with the with the nice Bible, and as they walked into the front of the church, they wanted everybody to see what they looked like. Why? Because they appeared holy. So now they brought this young lady in front of Jesus Christ, and they asked him sarcastically, "Teacher, this woman is caught in the act of adultery according to Moses' law." She's supposed to be stoned. Isn't it just like Adventist folk that quote, quote scripture at the wrong time? We like to quote scripture at the wrong time. This is not time for scripture. This is time for healing. So they asked him, what do you say? And you see, Jesus had a lot of swag. The Bible says he was stupid. He was already sitting. He was already in a sitting position. But he got down on his all fours and he began to write. And as he began to write, people realized that, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm starting to see my deeds in the sand. Uh, uh, so as he started writing, he started calling out the folk that brought her for persecution. You see, be careful of the people that you hang around, family, because the same people that you hang around may try to use you for personal gain. And that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to use this lady to make sure that, that they felt good about their doctrine. But you see, the thing about the word is you cannot bring the word to trap up the word because he is the living word. So what you have to realize is when, when you bring the word to the word, he's going to show you what the word is. Amen. So he started writing in the sand. And as he started writing, folks started to see themselves in the sand. And then they got a little bit scared and they started Phasing out one by one, but I like the part where the Bible says it was from the oldest one first to the youngest one last. Just put a pin in that, young people. I'm talking to you real quick. Where my young people at? Clap some noise, young people. Where you at? Okay, this part. This, are you feeling young today, my brother? Amen. You as young as you want to be. You see, here's the thing. The reason why the Bible say that is because I'm tired of the older folk picking the young people when it comes to sin. There's a reason why they said the oldest one first to the youngest. There was, it's impossible for us to, re to be on this earth 55, 65 years and think that we got less than the young people. I'm going to let y'all figure that out. I'm going to let that. You, gonna, you guys going to get that one on Tuesday. Tuesday you're going to get that one. So the reason why the Bible said the oldest one left first is because sometimes the older folk need to realize that they're the ones that got the most experience but the most sin because it's just the way numbers go. I need you guys to stop. I need you guys to stop telling the young people where you at and, tell, and start telling them how you got there. I don't want to know your destination. I want to know your process. How'd you get to being a good, upstanding, Seventh-day Adventist Christian? We, we, sometimes the older folk forget that they used to turn up in the 70s and 60s. They forget, they get, they get, uh, uh, they get amnesia at these parts because they got saved. It's good to be saved, but don't forget where you came from. So now... Jesus is now talking to the young lady as, after he, he got back up. He stood back up and he asked her. Now, you got you to gotta see the picture right now. This woman is ashamed. This woman has been caught in the act of adultery. And it is true that at that time she needed to be stoned. But you see, Jesus always exercises grace before doctrine. Oh, I'm going to let that sing. I'm going to let y'all think about that for a minute. He always exercises grace before doctrine. You see, she was supposed to be stoned, but grace. Uh -huh. She was supposed to die, but grace. She was caught in the act, but grace. Grace, grace, God's grace. So now, he says to her, he's, he probably by this time, he set her up. And he says, look around you. Where are the people that brought you to the church board? Uh-huh. Where are the people that brought you to the business meeting? Uh-huh. Where are the people that they had, they didn't know, they don't know how to mind their business, and they're all in your business. Where are those people that talk behind your back? 
Where are those that slander your name? Where are they? And now she looked around and she says, I don't see them. Now this is the part that I want you to understand. This moment, God, uh, through Jesus Christ, uh, used the, the woman's posture, her, her presentation. Uh, 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 when she first arrived at Jesus Christ, she was, uh, her posture was, she was thrown on her face, and, 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 and it now brings me to the word prostrate. I want you to follow me real quick because you see, when we use the word prostrate, family, we use one meaning. We use the meaning of laying on your face in worship, in, 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 in reverence. But you see, in, in this situation, this young lady, G, through Jesus Christ, he was able to exercise both meanings of one word at the same time. Okay, let me, let me break that down for you further. You see, the meaning of the other side of the word prostrate means to belittle, to, to, to bring down, to embarrass, to make small, to, to, to make weak. And that's how she arrived at Jesus Christ. She arrived small. She arrived demeaned. She arrived weak. She arrived feeling bad about herself. But in that same position, Jesus Christ, through grace, was able to allow her to exercise the other meaning of prostrate. So at the same time, she was able to reference him and, and, and to worship him and to be on her face in, 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 in worshipful magnitude. And now... And now she's blessed. At the, but listen, she never had to change her position to reach her destination. Oh, come on, somebody. She never had to change her situation. God went into her mess. Oh, Jesus. So God went into her messed up situation and changed her situation and changed her destination. So now he says to her, if, if they don't condemn you, I'm not going to condemn you. Go and sin no more. But we're going to change those words today and we're going to say, woman, thou art. So that was one woman that we loosed. So now we're moving on to the next young lady. And I want you to remember her posture. Her posture was on her knees because there's no, you see the thing about this situation, I want you to realize that the Bible has a lot of stories of great men, which is good, but we're not talking about the fellas today, amen? You see, because there's something about a worshiping woman. Oh, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. There's something about a worshiping woman that's different than a worshiping man. You see, there's a, there's a, there's a certain kind of endurance that a woman can withstand when it comes to stress and sin and, and, and things in this life. What am I talking about? All right, let's talk about the lady in, uh, <clears throat> with the issue of blood. Now, the Bible tells us, <clears throat> the Bible tells us that this young lady had an issue of blood for 12 years. Now, what I want you to understand is she was suffering with bleeding for 12 years. So in other words, she spent 12 years being anemic. Uh-huh. She spent 12 years being weak. She, sp she spent 12 years having, going through headaches. She, she, she didn't feel like herself for 12 years. But you see, one... One day, I guess, as she was scrolling through her Facebook feed, or she was maybe on her Instagram, she realized that Jesus Christ was coming through town. Why? Because uh, at the same time, there was a brother that, that had lost his daughter named Jairus. And Jesus Christ had got the message. He, 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 he had to now go and heal this young lady. Now, at this time in Jesus' life, he, he, was, he was famous. You know, he had just returned from Capernaum. He had just cast out uh, some demons. He, he, had, he had dealt with the demoniac. He had performed some miracles. So by this time, Jesus is now famous. So as he reached back to his, 
his, his, to, to Jerusalem. A message comes. Jairus sends his messenger. Well, he actually went himself and he spoke to Jesus. I said, you need, I need you to come. I need you to come because my daughter is dead. So now the Bible tells us that Jesus was surrounded by so many people. It was crowded. The streets were packed. Jesus was surrounded, surrounded by his disciples plus other people that just wanted to see him. So as he started making his way to the house, the young lady said, I got to seize this opportunity. In the midst of my struggle, I got to seize this one opportunity. I got to go after Jesus. So now, <clears throat> what I want you to understand is, at this time, women weren't supposed to be out with this issue. According to Moses' law, she was supposed to be secluded for seven days until she was made clean. But the problem is, she wasn't clean for 12 years. So she said, you know what? I'm going to have to excuse myself from this Moses law because the living law is going to be passing by and I might need to reach out and touch him and I'm going to take my chance. So now this young lady, she sets out, she sees, she sees a crowd. She probably doesn't even see Jesus Christ. And she's reaching out and she's starting to make her way through this crowd. Mind you, I said she was weak. She was feeble. She was cold. She probably was getting knocked around by all the bigger men that's in the, in the vicinity. But you know what? Sometimes when the struggles of life knock you down and you're pursuing Jesus, you got to get up and Get back on your feet and push again. And sometimes life will knock you down, but you got to get back up and go again. And what she realizes now, she starts to see, she starts to see the back of Jesus. And as she makes her way closer, she starts to realize that she's getting closer. Yes, she was weak, and yes, she was being knocked down, but every move she made, she found herself being a little bit closer to Jesus. And as she pushed forward, she realized that she was getting closer to Jesus. And now Jesus was making his way to the house uh, 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 and he was going through Jerusalem's cobble streets and they were probably narrow so she's fighting her way and as she reached out Jesus would turn and she missed it but she would get back up and she would go again and as she reaches out again Jesus would move and she's just missing she just wants to get her hand onto Jesus but guess what there was one last time sometimes you gotta gather every bit of strength that you got gather everything inside of your body gather every ounce of and, and, and when you're ready to reach out the Bible says she reached out and she touched the hem of his garment she said in my in my words I said she reached out and she grabbed a fool I don't even know what a fool is but she grabbed it and I don't know about y'all, but in order to touch the hem of somebody's garment, uh, the last time I checked, the hem is at the bottom of the, the garment. So in other words, this lady reached out with all she had. And she reached out in her posture again, put her on her face to touch the hem of his garment. So now she's back in that same posture. Oh, she's in that same posture of worshiping again. Sometimes the only way to approach Jesus is on your face. I'm talking to the worshiping women in here. Sometimes you just got to lay across your, bread, your bed and bring your children up in prayer. Sometimes you got to lay on that floor and offer up your marriage in prayer. Sometimes you got to lay in tears and offer up your health in prayer. Sometimes your posture says, be on your face. So now, the most amazing thing about this story is Jesus was already, already rubbing shoulders with people. He was already touching folk. There were so much people touching him, but still somehow, some way, he said, somebody touch me. Turn around because I felt power come out of me. You know what it's like for Jesus to say, somebody touch me in the midst of people touching him. I'm talking about desperate desperation. This lady had to have been desperate. And she took a faith of she took a leap of faith. The problem with some of us is we're not where we're supposed to be because we're not taking that leap of faith. We 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 try to run the Christian race, but we've been on the starting block for 12 years. 
And I'm talking about from somebody that runs, that used to run track. I used to run track in high school and I was pretty good. Pretty good like, you know, four high school records, but whatever, we're not talking about me right now. So I know about running track. But so, so when you get down on, your, on the block and that gun goes off, you gotta make that leap. But the problem with some of us is either we're false starting, uh-huh, we're going too early, or when the goes off, we're not running at all. Because we looked at the track, and you see that the track is so big that I'm not gonna even run the race. But this young lady said, I'm gonna leap, and I'm gonna take this leap of faith. And she touched the hem of his garment, and instantly she was healed. But the part that I like even more, she says, when he asked, there was a pause. And now she had to confess that it was me, Lord. You know the song, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my mother, not my father, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Well, this is what this young lady was saying. She said, it was me. It was me, oh Lord. I'm the one that touched you. And I was instantly healed. I want you to understand something. This young lady, after she was healed and he told her to go and sin no more, <clears throat> it changed the way she praised. It changed the way that she talked about God. It changed the way that she witnessed. You see, because a lot of us are having issues with evangelism because some of us haven't been through something yet. It's really that simple. Yeah, you might be 45 and you might have thought you have lived your life. And, but some of us need to go through something. You see, this lady went through a struggle for 12 years. She finally touched the hem of his garment. And now he's, he has healed her. And now her praise is different. And then he told her, by the way, your sins have been forgiven. The thing I like about Jesus, church is that he deals with your needs first. Uh-huh, I, 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 I need you to understand what I'm saying, Ro. He deals with your needs first. You see, the, the problem that I, that I have sometimes with us church folk is we try to preach the doctrine before we preach Jesus. You see, if I come into this place and I'm broken and my, and my life is messed up and this is life or death and I'm on the brink, I don't wanna hear about the 2300 day prophecy. I don't want to hear about the validity of the sanctuary. I want to know that Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Preach Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. So now, once again, after she raises up from her face, her posture, Jesus tells her that your sins have been forgiven and for the sake of the sermon, he tells her, woman, thou art. So now, moving on to the next young lady we're talking about today. We're going to be talking about the young lady who showed us how we should treat Jesus when he's in our house. You know, one thing I've learned about women, since we're talking about women today, is that when all of, our, all, all of the, the married men, clap your hands real quick. Come on, fellas, clap like you're proud. Your wife's sitting right next to you. Make some noise. So the thing about when you're trying to, I, I, those have just, just, had, just gotten married, you're not sure about how it is to live with a woman. The first day that you say that you're gonna bring your boys over, well, maybe just your family. And that is when you realize how a woman treats the guest that comes into her house. In your eyes, fellas, 
the house is clean. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like stuff is in order, but in her eyes, she got to clean, she got to wash, she got to wipe, she got to spray, and then cook. So there's a way that a woman treats guests in her house versus a man who would think that once things are in order, it's good. I happen to, uh, to be married to a, a different kind of woman. And what I mean by that is she does the same things, but the way she does it is very impressive. You see, before I got married, I didn't know that women were crazy. And I don't mean crazy in a bad way. It doesn't always have to be bad. Just crazy like in an amazing way. Because, with, yeah, yeah, I got to, you're right, because I got to go home. I got to drive an hour and a half now. So I got to make sure I say the right thing. Amen? So the thing, the thing that I, that was very, one of the things that stood out to me about being married is that, like, you don't have somebody that has your back like your wife. Nah. This, this is what I'm talking about. You see, I, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, so the driving situation in New York is, is crazy. And the thing about it is, family, is that I thought that I had road rage. But you see, when I'm driving with my wife, my wife has worse road rage than I do. So I'll be driving and I see a hand come over and honk the horn. And like, you see, so I don't have to put my energy into having road rage no more. Because she's like, I got you. I'm going to be crazy for you, baby. Just one of the many, many, many things of, or pluses of being a married man. So, Jesus is now entering Simon's house. He's actually there for a while. And a young lady comes in, busts through the door, busts through the crowd. And she falls at Jesus' feet. And she starts crying and washing his feet with her tears. And he, she's pouring expensive perfume on his feet and wiping it with her hair. Now Jesus looks Jesus just freezes the room. He looks, at the, he looks at the owner of the house. And he says, you see this woman right here? I came into the house. You didn't give me water for my feet. But she's washing my feet with her tears. Since I entered the house, you didn't greet me with a kiss. But since I her, she's been kissing my feet. Now, I don't know about you, but when a woman is going through something, they can exercise or tap into certain emotions that a man can't. If you want me to break it down for you, let me, let me go back all the way to when Adam and Eve sinned. There was something about getting the woman to sin. I'm going to get deep, deep on y'all for a second. Could Satan have went to Adam and gotten him to sin? Of course. But where was the challenge in that? You see, to get a woman to make a decision, women are too analytical. They think too good. They're going to process and, and analyze things before they make a decision. So there was a reason why Lucifer went to the woman. Because that was the challenge. Now, coming down through the years, when a woman, you flip that on a good side, when a woman is going through something, whether it be traumatic or whether it be something that they're clinging to Christ about, she took her own hair and she wiped his feet. She wiped it with her tears. There's a certain worship or a certain passion in worship that women can exercise. That 
it's hard for men to reach to. I'm not saying that men aren't worshipers. It's not what I'm saying. Follow me. We talking about women today. Men, you're going to get your turn. There was something special about this scene right here. But once again, check her posture. She was on her knees, on her face, crying to the Savior, pouring out everything that she had inside of her. Why? Because she was showing us how to worship. A lot of things happen in our lives because we're not worshiping correctly, family. We don't give God enough time in the day. We're focused on the wrong things. We're worried about our bills. Just worship. It's going to take care of that. Uh, we're worried about our kids being wayward and not listening and not being responsible. Just worship. He'll take care of that. We're worried about our marriages being on the rocks and, and, and dealing with issues, marital issues. Just, just worship. He'll take care of that. Sometimes in life, all you have to do is just worship. So now he looks at the young lady and he says, your faith has made you whole. And for the sake of the sermon, yes, he tells her, go and sin no more. But he said, woman, thou art. Now, in Luke 13, 10, it actually speaks about a woman. The Bible says that she was bounded by a, bounded by a spirit for 18 years. Or, or, or in, in, in layman's terms, she was... She was bent down. It was like a spirit was sitting on her and had her posture broken for 18 years. Now, what I want you to understand is there may be things that you're experiencing in your life. It's going to take some time for you to get over it. You see, a lot of times as Christians, family, we, we want instant gratification. Like we want to pray about something and as soon as we get up off our knees for it to go not realizing that sometimes it's going to take some time to get through your circumstance. But the thing I like about it, the Bible says that Jesus once again was teaching on the Sabbath. He was in church. He was preaching. And as he gazed through the crowd, he realized that there was a woman out there that her posture was off. She was bent over. She wasn't, she wasn't standing correctly. So what he did is that he went over to her and he said, woman, you are free from your infirmity. In other words, woman, thou art. And now the Bible says when she straightened back up, first thing we got to do in our lives is straighten up. We got to straighten up. The Bible says when she straightened up, she started to praise God immediately. Uh-huh. But I want us to focus on what we do. He might have put some money in your pocket. The first thing you want to do is splurge, not praise. Uh-huh. He might, he might bless you with the nice house that you always wanted. The first thing you want to do is invite people over and show them what you got. Not praise. He might have blessed you with the woman that you've wanted all your life. And some of us start to feel like we did something. No, that was God too. The Bible says when she was healed, she straightened back up and started worshiping God immediately. Sometimes when God blesses you and gets you out of your situation, the first thing you should do is praise. The first thing you should do is give thanks to him. But I want you to see, when she started praising God, family, this is what we do. This is what we do. The Bible says, as she was healed and started praising God, we had folk in the audience or congregation that started to say, that started to say who is this that even heals on the Sabbath? My, my, my. Who is this that even heals on the Sabbath? But you see, once again, Jesus, I love the way he, I love the way he answers. Jesus was very dogmatic. He didn't hold any punches. He didn't, he didn't have time to, to make you feel good. He says, 
He said to them, he said, aren't, aren't y'all the ones that on the Sabbath day let your donkeys and your oxes out to eat? Aren't y'all the same ones? So why not can I heal someone on the Sabbath day? In other words, church is good. Coming into the sanctuary is great. But there's a lot of work outside the sanctuary that's not getting done on the Sabbath day. Can I talk about it? You see, these four walls ain't going to get you into the kingdom. It's the work that you do outside the four walls are, that's going to get you into the kingdom. You see, it's always good to be a, a visual Christian on, seven, on, seven, on the seventh day. But who are you on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? Are you a believer on Monday? Are you going to stand for him on Tuesday? Will you be a witness on Wednesday? Are you going to do something for Jesus on Thursday? Are you going to be a blessing to someone on Friday it's easy to talk about it but you see you got to do more than talk about it you got to walk the walk you got to talk the talk you got to live the life my issue because he ain't done with me yet when I'm driving to work and I get cut off, gotta swerve a little bit, maybe almost touch paint with the, the guardrail because somebody's in more of a rush than me. Always oh, hard at them times to be a Christian on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. You know, when things happen in life, are you reflecting his personality, family? Are you being Christ like at work? What are the things that you're looking at? What are the conversations that we're having? These are the things that we're going to be judged on. Folk act like they're going to be judged on if they, were, if they were in church at 9.15 every Sabbath. Like, like there's a quota, like God is just checking, like, okay, he's been, he's been uh, on time, he's been punctual. God doesn't care about your Sabbath school punctuality. He does not care about what church you go to. He does not care about a lot of the things that we care about. He doesn't even care if you were a, the first elder, the Sabbath school superintendent, the pastor, the head deacon. He doesn't care. He cares about your works. He cares about what you do to get other people saved. He cares about how you live your life for him every single day. That is what he cares about. Another story about that same emotional investment that women do. A few years ago when I was still living at home with my mom, it was summertime and I was hanging out downstairs by my grandmother. And we live of uh, the part of Brooklyn that, uh, that, that we live in. It's, it's very busy. Uh, and there was an accident that happened on the side of like to the left of my house. And my mother is, is, is she, my mom is funny. Because I'm watching my mom like run up the street with like this panic on her face. Like, you know when your mom is panicking and you're looking and you're like, what's going on? She opens the door and I'm like, mom, mom, what happened? And she's like, somebody got hit by a car. Where is Osric? I'm like, mom, I'm, I'm right here. But she's asking me, Where, where's Osric? Somebody got hit by a car and it looks just like Osric. And I'm like, mom. I'm right here. I'm talking to you. But she, in her mind, you see, there's no love like a mother's love. Because in her mind, her son was underneath that car. And now in her mind, she's panicking like, even though she's talking to her son, I'm like, Mom, I'm right here. There's no love like a mother's love. Because when they love you, they love hard. Actually, when I was preparing this sermon, the Holy Spirit gave me an anecdote to tell you the closest love that we have between Christ-like love and, and our love and godly love and the way he loves us is a mother's love. A mother would lay her life down instantly 
so that you can have a chance. There's nothing like a mother's love. And that's why today we honor them, but really and truly every day should be Mother's Day. Because without mothers, there can be no fathers. No uncles, no aunties. So love your mother, cherish your mother. Be respectful to your mother. Because guess what? You can only have one mother. Yes, you can have a spiritual mother, mothers of the church that can guide you. But if your mother's still on this earth today, respect her, love her, cherish her. So many stories I've heard of women that, and men that they don't talk to their moms. For whatever reason. Listen, your mom is not perfect. Your dad is not perfect. You're not perfect. So at the end of the day, honor your mother and your father. Why? Because your days will be long on this earth. And that's for the young people. I know it becomes a time, my young ladies, little teenagers, between, you know, 15 and 20, where the, the, the bump, the, the heads with the, they bump heads with their mothers. Listen, your mom is doing the best that they can to teach you the ways that you should be brought up. So you look back, even myself now, I'm 32, and I'm looking back at when I was 21 and 19 and the stuff that I didn't appreciate about my mother. And now, sometimes in my quiet time, I'm like, yo, you were really bugging the way that you used to treat your mom. So now I make up for it by just being the best son that I could be. So it's a good thing that I caught it early. Some people don't get this until they're looking at their mother in the box about to be put in the ground. And then they want to say, mom, I love you and I'm sorry for everything that I've done. Don't wait till it's too late to give flowers now funerals don't count so this young lady who was bounded up for 18 years Jesus blessed her and she says woman thou art loose and then, the, then they started talking about Jesus as he shouldn't he shouldn't heal anybody on, on the Sabbath day but he blessed her and he sent her on her way. Before I land this plane, there's another story about posture that I want to bring up. And it was about the posture that Jesus Christ himself was assuming on that Thursday night in Gethsemane. You see, the posture that Jesus was assuming that Thursday night is that that very moment in time, he was dealing with something that had never been done before. Where's my musician? He was dealing with something that had never been done before. His posture was... That he is now on his face in the garden of Gethsemane, pleading with God the Father, asking him to please, if there was another way, please take this responsibility, take this burden away from me. You see, at that moment, Jesus was dealing with the, the situation that he was dealing with is that he, his physical humanity couldn't deal with the spiritual responsibility. And now he's in Gethsemane and his body is breaking down physically. Historians say in the Bible says that the capillaries in his blood vessels burst. The weight of every sin that will ever be and that ever was was on our Savior's back. And now he's looking up to divinity and he's saying, Father God, this weight is too much for me to endure. 
but at the same time he's exercising that love no greater love no greater love he's exercising that love for you and me and as they're now arresting him on that evening sunset Thursday night they put a bag over our Savior's head and they punched him they slapped him they kicked him they hit him until the point he wasn't even recognizable oh but it gets worse before it gets better now our savior is on pay-per-view he's at court square the center of attention he's now tied to a whipping block like he's an animal might i add he was innocent until guilty family the bible says 33 stripes was the maximum penalty during the roman empire Historians say that they used a bull whip to beat our Savior. And I don't know about you, but a bull whip is a whip with nine prongs. And at the end of the prongs is metal. So it whips your flesh even more when you are whipped with this specific whip. Historians say that when they whipped our Savior and they dragged the whip off of his body, you can see the bones in his back. He was mutilated for our transgressions. But now it even gets worse before it gets better they put a they put his robe back on his body now I don't know about you uh, anybody here ever had cloth touch an open wound it burns imagine your whole back being open and you got cloth on it and they put the crown of thorns on his head so by this time our savior is dehydrated He's mutilated. He's losing blood at a tremendous rate. But guess what? He looked through the annals of time and he saw us right here at Bridgeport Tabernacle Seventh day Adventist Church and he said that I'm going to keep on pushing because the love that I have is greater than anything possible. So the Bible says, He's on his way now to Skull Mountain. Galgutha, we would say today that he was on his way to death row. He was destined to the gas chamber. Guess what? He was still innocent until proven guilty. So now he's on the road to Galgutha. It's hot in Jerusalem. The sun is scorching. It's dusty. Our Savior is dehydrated and mutilated and weak. And on top of that, he's carrying our cross. Yeah, I said it right. Our cross. Not his cross, my cross. My sins, my mess ups. He's carrying that. And historians say... I don't know if you know this. Historians say the cross was about 350 pounds. So he was carrying our cross that weighed a whole lot. And, 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 and our Savior barely can drag this cross. He kept falling down, but he got back up again. He kept on getting back up. And he would fall down, but he would get back up. For me, 
I need you to realize that I was supposed to be underneath that cross. I was supposed to be mutilated. I was supposed to be the one that was thirsty. I was supposed to be the one that was whipped on that block. But he said, I'm going to step into your place and I'm going to do it for you. So he got up and now he started taking our cross to Calvary. They stretched him wide and they put the nails in his hands and feet for him to breathe because of his posture on the cross. For him to breathe, he had to push up on the nails. So in addition to his suffering, he was now drowning in his own fluid. That's why when they pierced his side, water ran out. The lungs were developing that he couldn't breathe. <laughs> but guess what though? In that situation, he's still saying, Father God, Father God, forgive them, forgive them. Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And I need us to realize that we need to have the faith of that thief. He knew that he messed up. He knew that it was over for him in this world. He knew that he was on death row. But I need us to have the faith of that thief and say, Father, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. I know that I've been struggling with issues, but remember me. I know cancer had hit the body, but remember me. I know my kids are messed up right now, but remember me. I know the marriage is messed up right now, but remember me. I know I've been struggling with all kind of issues, but remember me. And he says, he probably looked over as much as he could turn. And he said, today, not tomorrow, but today, not next week, but today, you will be with me in paradise. We're talking about instant grace. And then he looked up to the Father. And he hung his head and he said, it is finished. He gave up the ghost. What I want you to understand right there, Bridgeport, is that for that moment in history, the enemy thought that he had won. There was, there was, there was that one point in history where Lucifer a.k.a. Satan, a.k.a. Beelzebub, a.k.a. The, the great red dragon, he thought that he had won. Because our Savior is now dead, or so they thought. So all Friday night vespers, they were partying. The devil and his imps having a good old time doing Friday night Vespers. It's Tabby school, they still partied. Divine Hour, they still partied. AY, they still partied. Even through the lock-in. But what they hadn't planned for was Sunday morning. You see, they didn't plan for the time where in heaven, Jesus, God was looking for a special agent named Gabriel. You see, Gabriel was heaven seal team six. After Lucifer had been thrown from the kingdom, he was now heaven special forces. He only got the special uh, missions and he, choose, he chose to accept it. But you see, 
Gabriel was such a great soldier that he didn't even wait for the command from the general. Yeah, the Bible says that he took off from heaven with the speed of thought. Uh, uh, but you see, the way that Gabriel was set up, you see, with his six wings, he used them all for propelling. You see, the way Gabriel was set up, he said, I'm going to leave with the speed of sound. But now that's too slow. I'm going to kick it in the high gear, and now he's at the speed of light. No, 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 no. That's a little too slow. And now he said, I'm going to move at the speed of thought. And now as Gabriel parts the, the atmosphere and he's coming in, I can see my man moving through the, moving through around Uranus. And, I, and then he's moving around Venus. And he's cutting over through Mars. And he's, now he's seeing Venus. And as he sees our planet, he's coming in so hot that he had to use those air brakes. Because if he came in any hotter, he would blow this planet up. And as he hit the ground, the Bible said it was a great earthquake. And as he hit the ground, he looked around and he probably looked at the Roman soldiers like, I, I, I ought to, but I'm not going to do that right now because that's not my mission. As he went over to the, to the stone and he bumped the stone back with one of his big wings. You see, there was something special that was about to happen right there. You see, he was dead all, all on Friday night. He rested all the way on Saturday. But now on Sunday morning, you see, he needed a messenger to open this, this door. Because in the, uh, there's a writer that says kings don't open doors for themselves. So he needed Gabriel to swing open that big door. And now as he stepped out, he says, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? Because I have the keys of hell in my hand. He assumed the posture so that we can be saved. He exercised salvation so that we can live eternal. My appeal is very simple, family. I know today the emphasis is mothers. It's Mother's Day, which is great. But also today, we got to also thank God for salvation. We got to thank God for an opportunity to make things right in his kingdom one more time. And now, before we close, we need to realize that some of us may have things somewhat in order. But you see, the thing about us, family, we don't struggle with a lot of things. We struggle with the same old things over and over again. So my appeal is this. If you just want to stop struggling with the same old things and get it right, stand to your feet right where you are. If you're saying to God, Father, I don't want to seem like I'm playing church anymore. I want to make it into the kingdom when you come like for real like I don't want my singing and praying and preaching and reading and worship to be in vain but I actually really want to make it into the kingdom when you come oh God you see the thing about this life family is that sometimes we feel that God doesn't understand that life happens but he knows that life happens. You see, he's, he's interested even in our little situations. I want you to understand that at this point in life and in history, there are things happening all around us, family. You turn on the news, you watch what's going on in the world. The signs are telling what's happening. The earth is trying to tell us what's going on. There's a shifting in the atmosphere that's starting to happen that even science can't even understand. Why? Because soon and very soon, 
we're going to see the king. And I don't know about you, but I want to be in that number. I want to be in that number when the world is called up yonder. I'm going to say, I'm going to say a special prayer today for the mothers. And then I'm going to pray for everyone collectively. So while I'm praying, I need you to pray also for things that you need help with in your life. So we'll be praying together, family. Every eye is closed. Every head is bowed. Father God, your people are here. We need a blessing from you right now, oh God. Father, the struggles of life are tremendous. It's heavy. Sometimes it even messes up our posture. Where we're bounded with infirmities, oh God. Oh God, we need a word from you today. Like what you told the woman when you said that she is now loose from her infirmities. Father, some of us have been struggling with things for years messing up with the same old problem for years oh god we need a breakthrough right now father god father we've been asking you to break the chains when you always had the key to the lock father god but still we mess up over and over again but we thank you for your grace, oh God. We thank you for that mercy that you exercise on us every single day. Yes, Lord. Father, we really want to be saved in your kingdom, oh God. We don't want to play around with our soul salvation. The enemy is really a roaring lion at this moment in history. Seeking to devour anyone he can find, oh God. Father, people are killing their children. Children are killing their parents. People are dying left and right, oh God. Father, now that we have an opportunity, help us not to hog this gospel, oh God, but help us to share it with everyone we come in contact with. Help us to always be a blessing to someone else, someone that may not know you, oh God. And in a very special way, Father God, we thank you for all the mothers in the place. Father, without them, there would be no us. Help us to respect them and love them and tr treat them the way that you want them to be treated, oh God. We thank you for all the experiences that we've shared with our mothers. Some of our mothers have gone on, oh God. Some of our mothers are still here. But we just thank you for our mothers. Regardless of the situation, oh God. We thank you for giving them the tender touch. We thank you for giving them the patience, oh God. We thank you for instilling all the nurturing qualities, their father, that a mother should have. And when it's all said and done, oh God, when you break those clouds open and you're standing there with your triple crown and your sash that says King of Kings and Lord of Lords, oh God, May we be running to you and be caught up in the air in the twinkling of an eye, oh God. This mortal shall put on immortality, oh God, to reign with you forevermore. And when we're standing on the sea of glass, singing the song of Moses and the Lamb, even to the point where the angels will have to stay quiet, May we be in that number, oh God. Be with the pastor of this church. Bless him. 
give him the strength that it's not easy being a leader in this ministry, oh God. Be with him, be with his wife, be with his family, and be with everyone in this church and even their extended families, whoever they're thinking about right now. This is our prayer in the precious name of your son, Jesus Christ. Let everyone under the sound of my voice say amen and amen. And remember, ladies and even gentlemen, whatever situation you're going through in life, remember the posture to assume. And when you get up out of your posture, he's going to say, woman, man, thou art. God bless you and have a good day. God bless your family.